Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. There's an air of expectation in the room. You've all gone quiet. That's my cue to say something. Uh, my name is Virginia Hausiger. I'm from the University of Canberra from the 5050 by 2030 Foundation at the Institute of Governance. <laughs> Sorry, I've done it again. I forgot the name of the Institute yesterday and I've just <laughs> forgot it again. Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis at the University of Canberra. Welcome. And I'd like to open by acknowledging that we are meeting on Ngunnawal land. And on behalf of all of you, we pay our respects to the elders past and present and emerging leaders. And thank you to MOAD for um, hosting this event here this evening. We've done some wonderful events through this series, the IGPA um, public talk series, um, and had some wonderful discussions in this room, as we should have, because this is where it all comes from or emanates from discussion around democracy. Now, uh, we, forgive me if I'm sounding a little bit uh, croaky and tired, we've had a couple of long days of chat and talk um, yesterday and today, uh, yesterday at the IPA National Conference and then today here in this room, um, we've been dissecting a lot of the discussion from yesterday in a research and practice symposium. So this evening, we're moving on to the big question, doing democracy differently, what works? Evidence from the latest experiments in Australia and beyond. And we have a formidable, fabulous, extraordinary panel here. And as I look at each and every one of them, um, I feel very, very honoured to be sitting here on this stage with them. So let me introduce to you, uh, one by one, our panel, for those of you who don't know, but I'm sure they're all familiar faces to you. Luca Belgiorno Nettis. Luca is the founder, Luca Can Wave is the founder and director of New Democracy, an independent, non partisan research and development organisation. Um, he's the managing director also of Transfield Holdings and many of its subsidiary com uh, companies, as well as the Sydney Harbour Tunnel Limited. He also held a number of positions, he has also held a number of positions on not-for-profit boards and committees, including chairman of the University Arts Committee, the University of Technology, UTS, and Western Sydney University. And Luca was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2009 for services to the arts and to the community through a range of philanthropic endeavours and executive roles. Welcome, Luca. And of course, you've all seen him on Q&A. And you might recall seeing him on Q&A, and I was madly tweeting about it at the time when he was chatting away and he made mention of our colleague at um, University of Canberra, John Drysack, and referred to him as the guru of deliberative democracy. And I started tweeting madly about it. Um, John Drysack is Australian, uh, an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and Centenary Professor. And, in the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis here at the University of Canberra. And before moving to UC, he was Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Australian Research Council Federation Fellow at the ANU. Working in both political theory and empirical social science, he's best known for his contributions in the areas of democratic theory and practice and environmental politics. Welcome, John, and thank you for joining us. And sitting next to me, not Nicole Curato. Dr. Nicole Curato is a Discovery Early Career Research Award Fellow at the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance, the University of Canberra. I'm going to be saying that so quickly. I'm going to be saying that in my sleep tonight, aren't I? Um, her work, Nicole's work focuses on democratic participation in post-disaster contexts, and she's currently working on a manuscript entitled Democracy in the Age of Misery. Mm, we'll talk about that. Which seeks to develop, and she's not a miserable person at all, but in fact a very optimistic one and a very, very charming one. Um, which seeks to develop a defensible theory of democracy amidst widespread suffering. So welcome, Nicole, and thank you also for joining us. <laughs> Jerry Stoker, sitting at the end here. Professor Jerry Stoker is Professor of Politics and Governance at the University of Southampton and a Centenary Professor of Governance at the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis at the University of Canberra. And we're very, very lucky to have him. Um, he's with us for part of the year. We're very lucky to have him at this time. His main research interests are in governance, democratic 
politics, local and regional governance, urban politics, public participation and public service reform. He's authored or edited over 20 books, as you can see, he's very lazy, and published over 70 refereed articles, very lazy, um, or chapters in books. Welcome, Jerry. And Nicole Hunter. Nicole is the co-founder of Mosaic Lab. Am I saying that correctly? Mosaic. Mosaic Lab. A team of engagement practitioners specialising in high influence engagement and deliberative democracy. She's 20 years experience working across government and private sector projects. And prior to co-founding Mosaic Lab, Nicole designed and delivered many successful engagement processes such as the G20 Regional Growth Plan, uh, Karangamite Regional Catchment Strategy and the CFA's Community Engagement Framework Connecting with Communities. And she's worked on a range of projects such as the Post-Alpine Fires Community Engagement Strategy 2004 and in fact a number of deliberative democracy uh, projects which we will talk about. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see we've got a fantastic, uh, a fantastic collection of people here. Doing democracy differently, what works, evidence from the latest experiments in Australia and beyond. Well, why are we even talking about this? Well, let's cut straight to the chase. The reason we're talking about this is because democracy in Australia is in trouble, as we know. Uh, the work that IGPA has done over some time now uh, has, uh, if, we, if we needed it, given us a tremendous um, evidence base for uh, understanding that in fact the trust in democracy uh, has declined enormously across Australia. And in fact, if we look back on um, 2007 figures, 2007 figures, um, our trust in democracy was sitting at around, uh, or satisfaction with democracy I should say, was sitting around 85.6%. By last year, <coughs> we were down to 42%. So the figures, as we've been discussing over the last two days, the decline of trust and satisfaction in democracy across Australia uh, is hitting very, very hard and raising all sorts of questions about how do we respond to this um, and what are the practical, sensible solutions uh, in, in response to this. So there's some of the things we're going to talk about um, this evening. I want to, uh, I guess, when we talk about the question posed tonight, doing democracy um, differently, and what works, I guess the first thing we have to ask is doing, uh, doing democracy differently for whom and differently how? And what exactly are we talking about? Which is a very vague opening, I know, but I'm gonna throw that open to the panel straight away. And I know you're all looking quizzically at me saying, oh, really? But it, it, it's an obvious question. In fact, I'm going to throw that to you first, Nicole, because it's something that um, I think that y you have discussed in the past. When we talk about doing democracy differently, it's an easy kind of, um, a bit of a catchphrase, actually. But what are we talking about? For whom? Yes, I think I'll just draw on my own uh, work when it comes to disaster context. So as Virginia mentioned, my work has been about engaging in communities in post-disaster contexts, particularly in the Philippines. And if you imagine the Philippines, it's not really a developed country, it's a middle-income country. And if you imagine disaster-affected communities, these are communities that lost everything, all the material resources from a disaster. And if you are coming from the perspective of, let's say, technocratic, expert-driven kind of governance, you would think that, well, these people just lost everything everything, they are incapable of taking part in democracy. But I think the headline I want to say for this discussion is that when we think of democracy differently, we're thinking of ways in which we can creatively bring the voices of the most marginalized communities um, in the process, in this context, in the process of recovery. Doing it for whom? I think it's doing it for people who are directly affected by the decisions that both powerful people and ordinary citizens make doing democracy differently. How? I think there's this obsession about the concept of innovations, like we always have to innovate. But sometimes these innovations goes at the heart of recognizing what already local practices exists, what forms of communication work for particular communities. And I find that in my own experience working with disaster communities that there are informal feedback mechanisms that can be institutionalized. I guess as a closing example that I can raise, um, when I observed a lot of humanitarian organizations working in the context of disasters, there are a lot of tech tech-driven innovations, like these innovations could be SMS service 
or tweeting um, for relief and whatever. But what the, the key innovation that the humanitarian communities find is that actually face-to-face -face consultations with these communities still work, even if the Philippines is the Facebook capital of the world, the selfie capital of the world. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the assumption that we can do it differently because of technology still goes right at the heart of the importance of tapping, all, of tapping on these informal networks and informal forms of communication. So I guess that's the headline. Differently doesn't necessarily have to mean innovation that's so different. Sometimes it's just going at the heart of what has been working and recognizing existing cultural practices. Okay. John, do we need to do democracy differently in Australia? I think we need to uh, do democracy differently, not just in Australia, um, but, but throughout the world. Uh, that the um, I mean, the idea of deliberative democracy with which uh, I'm, I'm associated uh, tries to um, uh, pick up on uh, uh, the, the citizen capabilities which are, which, are, which are universal, although sort of manifested differently in, in, different, um, in different places. Um, I think if, we, if we're looking at, uh, if we look around the world today, I mean, many people portray a multifaceted crisis of democracy, uh, the rise of post-truth politics, uh, the rise of populism, which, uh, which which promotes uh, easy answers to complex questions. It seems there's just a whole host of problems associated with uh, conventional liberal democratic states. So uh, in that sense, it seems that uh, they're not doing democracy well enough. I think it's important that we need to, uh, to uh, deepen people's, uh, people's democratic engagements and to fight against all these, uh, all these trends which, which are currently undermining democracy um, on, on multiple fronts. Um, so in, in a sense, doing democracy differently um, is a defense of democracy uh, against some novel threats, uh, but it's also looking forward to a more hopeful future in which people's uh, democratic engagements are more meaningful and consequential. Okay, Luca, drilling that down to Australia specifically, now you've been very involved in, um, it, well, with new democracy of course, and um, deliberative democracy processes, and I guess you know, experimenting and practicing with those in Australia. What about Australia? Do we need to do democracy differently and why? <coughs> well, I think, uh, picking up what John's saying, uh, there is, it's plain that in all the surveys, uh, what's at the heart of the problem is that we don't have trust in the political institutions, but we also don't have trust in the political actors and the politicians. So it doesn't matter which country you come from virtually, politicians rank with used car salesmen. So nurses and doctors are up the top. So why is it that the politicians are down there? Well, I think it's become quite obvious that they're engaged in this cheap point scoring they're, they're political positioning themselves. They're trying to get the up on the other. <clears throat> and this might have been acceptable, if you like, in the past where there was this principal positions about oh, the good labor cause, the good liberal cause. But those causes there today don't, don't resonate with people like they used to. I mean, I think there's a real history here. Of, I actually think that the labor cause was the cause in the sense that it had to fight for its position to get its backside on the velvet, right, in Parliament. So now they've kind of got there, and so what are we fighting about now? Mm. So, so, you know, so people are thinking, well, they're still, it, it's actually become more about them getting into power than about us and resolving our, our policy issues. Okay. Nicole, and I didn't necessarily mean to go down the line like this, but it's just worked out that way, but Nicole, you have had some very practical experience in running processes, and in fact, a number of people, everyone sitting on this panel has, but can you give us a, a bit of insight as to the sort of practical um, deliberative democracy processes you've been involved in and, and how that works, for those of us who don't understand that process? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give you an example of some of the projects and then a brief summary of the sort of principles that underpin it, because it's quite complex in part. So the sorts of things, and there are various people in the, in the room who've also done this, um, uh, been involved in projects, but the sorts of work we've been involved in is um, the Geelong Citizens Jury, when the local council was dismissed and a random sample of local residents came together to define how their future council was to be formed. Uh, we've worked on the Vic Health Obesity Jury, which was all about how do we make it easier for us to all eat better? 
Uh, we've worked on things like the City of Melbourne participatory budgeting, the 10-year financial plan. So what's our long-term vision for planning and budgeting for this city when essentially we have a $900 million hole? So that's sort of the range of things. It's everything from finances through to um, you know, societal norms. Um, as well as democracy. So the Geelong Citizens Jury for me was super interesting because it was deliberative democracy on democracy, which is really interesting. And the principles I think that sit underneath all of these are sixfold, really. There's, you have a really clear remit. You know what the problem is, the dilemma that you're facing and you're clear about it. You've got a lot of information, so it's information-rich process. You bring data in, you bring speakers in, you really discuss that. Um, you, you have uh, representation, which in, in the most is random sampling. So you're randomly bringing people in. It's, sometimes it's 50% random, sometimes it's 100. It, there's a mixes that you can do. Um, there, it's a it's a blank page report, so they're not they're not checking something that's already been prepared. It's completely blank, and they're writing it from scratch collaboratively as a group, which everybody goes seriously. A hundred people write a report in four days. Yes, they do. Um, so you know they're the sorts of principles that sit underneath this. That of course deliberation and dialogue and testing things as you go, weighing up options, is kind of the core of of, of deliberative processes. Okay, I, I want to come back and interrogate a little bit. Before we do, Jerry, over to you. We, we've had a lot of discussion in the last day, um, here today, but particularly yesterday as well, um, at the um, Institute of Public Administration uh, National Conference, but uh, a lot of talk about engaging citizens more and um, with, underpinned by an assumption that that's the solution to the crisis in trust and crisis in democracy, etc. Do you think that that is the solution? Is, is it just about engaging citizens more and then we'll fix the problem? I think it's definitely one of the solutions I'd like to pursue. And I, I kind of preface the overall commentary by saying that it's important to look at democracy uh, not as a finished product, but as a continuing uh, program of development. I mean, our sense of the way in which democracy should work has to change in terms of the context of uh, the way that media works, the way that uh, people actually live their lives, the way in which people uh, operate. So I think that uh, there's a fantastic argument and a growing practice which enables people to engage but actually, the other thing I'm very keen on, and I think a lot of the evidence points towards the need to do something about, which is I actually think we need to change the way that elected politicians work and operate. Um, uh, I think that there is a danger that if all of our reforms are directly just focused on the idea of getting citizens to do more, we've left the uh, elected politicians off the hook. Uh, a, a lot of the problems in our political system are created by the way in which they've changed their behaviour. Mm -hmm. The way in which they offer politics is over-marketised, it's all sound bites, it's all sound and fury, it's not actually a way of engaging people. The way that parties and political campaigns are funded mm. is an excruciating embarrassment uh, mm. in most uh, liberal democracies. There are some fundamental reforms of the way in which the role of elected representatives work and operate that I think we also need to add to our agenda of change. In reality, though, is the way politics operates and the way elections are run and campaigns are run and that slick professionalisation of politics and politicians um, do you really think that that can change? I mean, it, it, we now, I mean, we live in a 24-hour a, a news cycle now where a soundbite is, once upon a time it used to be 25 seconds, now we're down to three seconds. You know, that's the reality of the world in which we live. So do you really, I mean, are you talking about going backwards or...? or? No, I, I think it is, first of all, I think there are some examples of the way in which politicians have begun to uh, behave differently. So uh, if you look at uh, uh, the context in Australia, say around the INDI uh, elected representative and the way in which you can construct a slightly different dialogue with your constituents and have a different relationship with your constituents. I think that um, in Ireland there was a fantastic example of a constitutional convention that actually mixed citizens and politicians in a 
sustained discussion about significant changes that were required uh, in the context of uh, Ireland itself. I, I think there's some fantastic examples of mayors in various cities across the world doing their politics differently. So I'm also going to pray in evidence all of these guys because uh, 20, 15 years ago, they all would have faced people saying, oh, you can't get people to be involved in discussions. Mm -hmm. What's the point of imagining that they could all deliberate, etc." But they proved that that can actually happen. So I don't think it's unreasonable for me to say I can see tentative signs of change, but we need to put the same level of reform effort and the commitment into making change, because I, I think it would be too lopsided if we simply just keep on asking citizens to do more. We need to change the way elected representatives work and operate. And if they don't change, I think we should ask them to leave. <laughs> yeah, we can try that. <laughs> Luca, go on. I just wanted to pick up on that. Um, I mean, I was saying that, uh, Jerry, before, we, we, we might have a nuanced uh, difference about our views on, on the, the, the future, uh, but I think um, uh, there is a a general agreement that there is a systemic problem with the way we affect our political representation at the moment. So the way we affect our representation is by this banal electioneering contest, which really uh, brings, it, it exacerbates the sort of things that, that we're, we're, we're so aggrieved about, which is the cheap point scoring, the sound bites, I'm better than you. There is, there is, there's no, uh, capacity in that process mm. to actually uh, develop a nuanced policy, public In fact, there is a, a conflation of the candidature for power with public policy development. The great advantage of the way political representation, I, and I use the, the notion of a citizen jury, of a citizen participation, is political representation because we're talking about public policy development. We're not talking about other things. So here is these citizens who have no ambition to power. They are only there for the, that job. They're not conflating their ambitions, personal ambitions for power with How do you know public they don't policy get a taste development. Of it, though, and get rather excited by the power. Sorry. How do you know they don't get a taste well, for then get rather excited? They're not, by they're, the they're not there to be re-elected. They're not there to be elected. They're, they have they're, they're like a like a criminal jury. Their only obligation is to do the right thing by their community. When people say, "Oh, how are they accountable?" Well, they're accountable like a, a, a jury is in a, in a criminal uh, jurisdiction. But having said that. A lot of people who do get involved in deliberative democracy processes do get more involved in civic affairs. It's, it's both anecdotal and research-based that people now say they start to get more involved. They've never been involved before and they now go, I think this is worth doing. So the fact that more people would actually get involved in more things as a result is a good thing. I think, can, I, can I just add that um, one of the great stories that Nicole was telling me that is uh, kind of part of response to the Jodong uh, jury when they got some rather stupid press coverage. Yeah. Uh, se several of the jury measures, uh, members went along and had a little discussion with the editor, didn't they? Yeah, they did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, at, at essence, at core, and I'm being provocative here, wearing my old journalist hat, these people are not experts. Yeah. Well, this is, I, I was saying to Jerry earlier, if I can say, I mean, I'm not going to take this forum, <laughs> but uh, essentially the great dynamic for me about democracy is how you marry the so-called sector professionals, the d domain experts, with the political representation in, in a way that you can get the, the, the real uh, sector input into the political representation. And, and th these jury type processes show that that can be done. I just want to add, because one of the, I think, most strongest criticisms I heard against these processes is from a colleague. She's Argentinian, and she said, what I really don't like about these processes, this deliberative democracy processes, is that I like power. We have to take power. And all that you're doing is relegating citizens to these processes that can be institutionalized to a certain extent, can be tapped on to a certain extent, but isn't the goal of politics to claim power. So that's this perspective of a more real politic type of appreciation of what democracy is. And I think where the exciting stuff in the literature, at least for the academics at the moment for deliberative democracy, is how you can engage the similar dynamic that we see in citizen juries within political parties. 
how we can institutionalize that same language of other regarding reason giving, of public spiritedness yeah. within political parties. So I guess that goes at the heart of what Jerry was talking about earlier. Reform should also happen inside, but I think that even interesting case here is how these citizen juries or the citizens enlivened by these democratic processes can engage in formal politics. That's a big debate. Should citizens remain as citizens or are we offering them a pathway to become um, professional politicians that are ethical, deliberative, and reason-oriented? Well, the moment that they actually indicate they want to become politicians, you pull them back. Yeah, because you don't want them to be. <laughs> Luke, are you going to say something there? Oh, no, I just think, you know, there's a systemic problem. I mean, uh, and then I have to sort of, you know, do this sort of song and dance about the Greek democracy because that's the inspiration for these juries. So when people talk about democracy being free and fair elections, sorry, democracy did not start with elections at all. The, the American founding fathers rejected the very word democracy because it referred to the Greek model. So how did the Greeks make their political representation happen? By lot. By lot. Random recruitment. And then, of course, the immediate reaction is from the, the, the great and the good, they've got no capacity, the, the great unwashed have got no capacity to understand anything. Mm. Why would you even think about doing that? Mm. And that's why we do these juries, basically to prove the fact that, no, just give people the time. And the quintessential genius of that Greek democracy is it's so inclusive from the outset, no question about parties, you know, uh, the, the, the underclasses, no, no, no. They're there in the middle of the discussions from day one, and it's deliberative because it's, it becomes automatically deliberative, like a jury. Mm. John, the ACT government has embraced this idea. Tell us a little bit about what they're doing and, and w w what exactly a mini public is. Okay, so um, I'll just start with what a mini public is. Um, so a mini public is uh, um, essentially, a, well, as a mini name implies, um, a relatively small group which can vary in numbers, usually from um, uh, usually around uh, 15 uh, to um, a couple of hundred at, at, at the outside. Um, and the, the, intent, the, the intention is it, it forms a kind of a microcosm of the public as a whole, um, so that, the, that uh, in, in some way the, the, the various, well, not just social characteristics, but also the, uh, the relevant starting points when it comes to points of view um, are somehow represented in the, um, in the mini public. Um, and then it, it proceeds by um, deliberative, deliberative means, so it should ideally uh, take place over um, a number of days, um, could be given sufficient time to deliberate the issue in, in question, um, and then uh, sort through the arguments on the different, the different sides of, of, the, of, of the issue. Um, it does not necessarily have to make a recommendation, although in practice uh, many, of them, uh, many of them do. Uh, the, the, the most important thing a mini public can do is actually uh, help create uh, better deliberation in the, in the public sphere as a whole. Um, as my colleague Simon Niemeyer puts it, uh, who's sitting in the audience, uh, uh, many public should be deliberation making when it comes to the political system as a whole. Um, so, uh, so people associated with my centre, um, especially Simon Niemeyer and uh, Wendy Russell with a little bit of input from myself, um, have been working on uh, on uh, developing a deliberative strategy uh, for the f um, f for the a deliberative engagement strategy for for the ACT, and there have been uh, and and so there's there's also been um, um, some some pilot uh, uh, pilot citizens juries which have, which have been run, um, although uh, well there have been many citizens juries many many publics um, run on. Uh, uh, run throughout the world on many different kinds of issues. So we, we, know, that, we know that they work in the, in the broad sense. Uh, we know that citizens um, are capable of uh, comprehending complex issues um, and sifting through the, arg the, the arguments um, for and against, uh, uh, for and against um, diff different policy proposals. So that, that's really not a, not a problem at all in, in knowing that. Um, I think the big question is uh, trying to figure out, well, what is the place of, uh, of many publics in larger systems of governance. And what is the place? Okay, <laughs> I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, <laughs> I think that many publics have particular virtues. Uh, they have some virtues, uh, um, but, but not others. Um, so I think the particular virtue that they have um, is that of reflection. Mm. Um, they don't necessarily exhibit the virtue of advocacy. 
which, is, uh, which, which we can find, um, or, or justification of, of particular policy proposals, which we can find <laughs> elsewhere in the system. And we can, well, can, we can, can bring... Can you explain that, though? Why is that? I, I can understand why they'd be great at reflection, but why not advocacy? I would have thought that would be um, because an often, obvious because, one. Yeah, because generally people come into the mini-public um, without any strong partisan positions of their own. Um, so they're in a position to, uh, to reflect upon the merits of, of, of the different sides. I mean, in the same way that we expect a jury in a criminal case to reflect on the merits of what the advocates say in the courtroom. Um, so that's why, um, that's why I think uh, re reflection is the key role of, the, uh, um, of, of a mini-public. Um, and in terms of uh, how, we, how we institutionalize that in the political system, well, um, one way of doing it would be, uh, would be constitutionally. Now, a, a maximal approach to this would be to, to, to constitute a citizen body as the upper house in a legislature. Um, so, for example, the ACT um, currently has no upper house. This would be uh, a great opportunity to institute some kind of citizen review body um, as part of a system of, so of like governance. So, like a house of review, effectively, yeah, over so it, the it's, assembly. So, it's exactly what the Senate, for example, is supposed to do and exactly what the Senate doesn't do. Um, the, Senate, the Senate in Australia, the Senate in the US, um, they're both houses of justification mm. um, in the same way that the, the lower houses. They, they just uh, replicate the dynamics of the, of the lower house. They don't act as a house of review um, in the way that they're supposed to. Um, a body constituted, um, of, of lay, constituted by lay citizens would be in a much better position to do that. Or you could experiment, um, if you've already got a Senate, for example, uh, why not um, have just a, a few members? Uh, appointed of uh, just a few lay citizens sitting there alongside the elected senators and see what difference that makes to the dynamic. So there's all kinds of things you can think about doing. Hmm. Can I throw it open to all of you on the panel? How, because you all have so much experience in, in this area and have been working away at these um, deliberative systems for, for some time, is this actually gaining traction, though, within the, the political sphere? I mean, are, are governments paying attention to this? And actually, other, I mean, obviously, the ACT government has picked up on it, as you'd expect in a progressive place like the ACT. But it, is it gaining traction as potentially really having a you know, significant input to there, our political as, system? As Jerry said, the, the really strong precedent is in Ireland. Can you, can you unpack that or explain the, it's two, uh, 2012. So nine, in 2012, following the crisis, the GFC crisis, as everyone understands, Ireland, along with Iceland and the other pigs, were, 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 um, were you know, down in the dumps and they, uh, there was quite a lot of disaffection with the political situation. So here is a right-wing government who basically said, had promised to do this convention and ended up doing it. Uh, to review their constitution, you know, and in their constitution they've got had crazy things like, you know, abortions illegal, marriage equality illegal, etc. So they, they agreed on a number of things, including the issue of marriage equality, which had to go to a referendum because the constitution had the same sort of requirements here, we needed a referendum to change it. So, um, but, so did I say it was constituted by 99 people, delegates, 66 of whom were randomly recruited. And they deliberated for some months. And, mm, and it worked. And we've had similar... And, and now it's continuing. In, in now they've got a body within the Prime Minister's office mm. who is doing these continuing citizen juries, and they've just done one now on abortion, because once again, abortion was, is in there. Mm. It's illegal to have abortion in Ireland, mm. in the Constitution. You know, go figure. Mm. Uh, so. Um, and, and so, and, and to, to, to John's point, so there's a number of proposals now for citizens' assemblies, let's call them senates, uh, around the world. It, mm. How much traction they're getting is, 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 is another question, uh, but we, I mean, I could keep talking about other aspects that are, uh, of government uh, sort of uh, uh, institutional players who are starting to talk the, the talk, uh, okay. Macron, Annan. Tell us a little bit about the, the process that you ran here back in 2009 here in, was it the Senate or the House of well, Reps? Well, well, John was the chief investigator uh, and uh, we had, in 2009, we wanted to see what people thought about how they would strengthen, the question was, the remit was how we might strengthen Australia's democracy and we recruited randomly one person from each of the 150 electorates around Australia. We brought 150 people here 
to Canberra for four days. We had, it was a six month process. They had a number of meetings in their various regional centres online and in presentations here. And then they, they, they deliberated and they came up with a number of recommendations, uh, not, which, not least of which was to harmonise state laws, introduce more citizen participation. And they, you know, that was nine years ago. But, but, so, so, but what happened as a result of that Very process? little because it was, I mean, we had, you know, it was Prime Minister Rudd's time and we had Anthony Byrne, who was the rep from uh, the Prime Minister's office, and you know there was all the talk of as John Faulkner came, and you know lots of sort of great and good, so but there wasn't really much take up because you know there wasn't much appetite for it, you know. But now, now you know, we, since then we've had, we've had, you know, we just say our greatest advocates now, are Mr. Trump, and, <laughs> and, and Brexit, because you know yeah. people have seen, well, how did we get to this? You know, so they're, they're actually. You couldn't talk about political reform 10 years ago mm. without people thinking, oh, that means a new party mm. or something, mm. you know? Can I, I want you to hold that thought, but we do have, um, I, I think there are a couple of people here who might have been part of this process in 2009 here in the House. And I know Robin who came and told, where are you, Robin? Robin, who came and told me that he was actually one of the guinea pigs yeah. in, um, uh, in that selection and was thrilled, one of the um, randomly selected people. Can you just tell us very briefly, Robin, what the experience was like for you in that process. You went into it knowing nothing about what was, why you were there or what it was about. And you mentioned to me that the experience was quite extraordinary. So can you just give us a, a, a brief rundown on what you did and how it felt? Yeah, I, I didn't know much at all about the idea of hold deliberative democracy. Is this? Yeah, it's on, just hold yep. it up, yep. Um, <clears throat> so I, I went in with uh, quite an open mind. Uh, I guess I'd, I'd been very much involved in public policy processes as a, as a consumer advocate over many years. But you were randomly selected. But I happened to be randomly selected. But I guess I was a bit odd. In, I, mean, I was perhaps sort of a participant observer in anthropological uh, terms uh, because I, I did know quite a bit about how the country was run. Um, but I was thrown together with a bunch of people who didn't know much at all about how the country was run. Uh, as I recall, there was a, a, a housewife from Brisbane, there was a policeman from Bathurst, there was a, um, an Aboriginal uh, youth worker from the Hunter Valley, uh, and uh, two or three others, I can't remember. Um, and what was just so fantastic was that these people who really hadn't had the chance to think much about how the country was run, over these four days, it was four, it was four days, uh, um, were able to inform themselves through the process um, so thoroughly well that they made really intelligent uh, proposals by the end of it. Uh, one, of the, one of them was a, um, somebody who came in with the idea that, oh, the answer to everything is uh, uh, citizens initiated referenda. By, by the end of it, he said, oh, gosh, no, that's a bad idea. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, was, it was really exciting. Uh, and I, I, I'm an absolute convert. So, I mean, I, I think that um, accidental politicians, as I call them, uh, are possibly more valuable than intentional politicians. <laughs> but I do, but I do think I do think that a, a mix of the two, and and I, I think the idea of uh, uh, converting the Senate to a a, yeah. a a bunch of accidental politicians like you know Jackie Lambie and uh, Ricky <laughs> Muir, you know, if they were all, if it was populated by those sort of people yeah. instead of the time servers that some of them are. Um, anyway, that's okay. uh, a big so ask. Thanks, Rob. And that was great. And it's, it's, um, it's a fascinating thing to, to get an insider's um, uh, take on that. But just coming back to where we go from here, there's been, Nicole, you've done, you've run a number of these deliberative processes that have been successful. But again, I come back to this point of, is it gaining traction? Where do we, where do we take this? If we are going to do democracy differently, and, and this is one solution, how do we make it happen? Well, first, is it gaining traction? I mean, I think the short answer is yes. I've seen in the last four years, uh, and I'm predominantly speaking about Victoria, but there have been in, in, in the other states as well a huge ramping up of this activity. And in no small part because of the work of people who are in the room here today. Um, where do we go from here? I mean, I'm all for revolution. <laughs> oh, why not? Why not? 
<laughs> but revolution how? I mean, we, how, how do you actually make that happen? Yeah, I mean, this is why I really enjoyed this uh, Geelong jury, because it was a discussion about democracy itself. And I, and I actually think that's the conversation we need to have in Australia, is we actually, actually need a random selection of people to come together and talk about how do we get properly represented in Australia. Mm. And a, a group of people who are accidental politicians with no set ideas, even if they come in with some, but lift up to this higher level, which is what happens in a room, I think creates far more bold decisions about what's possible than any politician ever does. I'll give you a really practical example. At the City of Melbourne jury we ran, this um, jury uh, decided that they should put rates up by something like 2.5 per cent. The citizens chose the citizens to increase, chose to increase the rates. Why would they do that? Because they saw the benefit. They said, we know these, we can get these things done if we have this money and it should be raised by X. And the councillors went, <gasps> <laughs> they went, we'll raise it a bit, not that much. We're not going to do it that much. Because no we'll way. lose the next election. Because we'll lose the next election. But, and there is, the work of this is tricky, and I'm sure I'd be interested in the other panellists' views on this. You do have a small number of people in the room when you do this. You have 50 or 100 or 35, and we do need to make the connection from that group of people out to the broader public. Mm -hmm. And that story needs to be told, and we're still mm -hmm. learning on how to do that best mm -hmm. so that everybody else understands that people like me really weighed this up and came up with a really good answer, and we can live with that. Mm. So that's the, the work ahead of us, I think, is we're getting, we've got the little bit going really well, I think. It's the story that spreads it beyond them that is the next step. At, at, at what point, though, do you, can you, do you stop these processes actually becoming um, politicised, institutionalised? Um, Luca? In all of these, as, as, as the Greeks did it, as, as every, every political representative process does, you cannot entrench incumbency. You have to have, you have to cycle people out. So if you want to have a citizens' assembly, Senate, it can't be for, for, for your life. It's a three-year appointment, whatever it might be. Mm. When you and there's no elections. So it's not as if people no, no need elections. to look, look to a constituency for popularising themselves right. rather than the issue. So we, we do away with elections. Jerry? Well... I think the, the problem I've got is that I want to be even more crazy than so far we've been crazy, which is that a lot of the reforms we talked about are actually just talking about changing the inputs into the democratic process. And uh, you rightly asked, well, what happens when people deliberate? And unfortunately, sometimes what happens when people deliberate is what they say gets completely ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, for me, was the attraction of the Irish... Uh, constitutional convention, which is they actually had politicians involved in the deliberative process. They then became owners of that deliberative process and then they followed through the processes of implementation. But this is a kind of wider uh, set of agendas we need to think about because we not only need to think about how we can change the dynamic of inputs into the political system, mm -hmm. but we know that people get annoyed with democracy because it actually fails to deliver for them, mm -hmm. both collectively but also as individual consumers of services too. So we need to think about how we can exercise different forms of control over the executive arm of government, the, go the arm that's actually involved in implementation. And there, I'm not so sure that either getting citizens involved or deliberation is the only or the best tool available. I think there are ways in which we could change the behaviour of elected representatives so they could perform that executive function for us and actually carry out uh, a lot of the input that has come from citizens. But then when it comes to the practice of implementation, I don't think we should be excluding citizens either. But maybe not always through deliberative juries, maybe through uh, co-design of projects, maybe through uh, various forms of co-production as well. There are, I think, a myriad of tools we, we could think about. And when, when people talk about democracy, they talk about their input, but they also care about the outputs mm, of the system mm. and the way it affects their lives. And I think the danger of 
simply focusing on citizens' juries or deliberation is you're focusing only on the kind of input and you're not actually dealing with the throughput of the political system or the outputs of the political system. So for me, there's an even greater range of institutional challenges there. Okay. I, I want to come to Nicole here, but just on that point, while, whilst I think of it, how do you, when you say change the behaviour of politicians, I mean, we talk about this and we have been talking about this for years and years and years, and we're only seeing behaviour get worse, not better. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean? I think uh, at, the, at the start, clearly there's an issue about the way in which uh, both political parties and uh, many political campaigns are actually financed now. So I think that it would be possible for us to imagine changing the way that they were financed, which took away the power from big business or big organized interests. And I think that there's overwhelming support. In fact, all our survey evidence tells us there's massive overwhelming support to do that uh, within Australia. So I think that's one thing. So it would create a cleaner politics. But then after that, I think it's about uh, constructing a different relationship between elected representatives and uh, citizens themselves. And I, I, as I said, I think there are some exemplars of how you could go about doing that. I liked Nicole's idea of introducing some of these deliberative and challenging processes within political parties themselves, I think which would create a rather different dynamic in terms of the way in which people are selected. Because, you know, political parties at the moment are the last bastion of really miserable uh, politics uh, and uh, they create miserable inaccurate. people and we don't like them uh, so they're, I, I think they're that, all run by blokes they're a prehistoric <laughs> relic they are a prehistoric relic so, yeah but you know the, 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 the institutions we know or the development even of marketized politics that scale of soundbite politics that's only occurred over the last 20 years mm. That's a relatively new development. Mm. In, in, in the UK work that we've been able to do, we have uh, interesting access to something called the mass observation studies, which were kind of essays that people wrote about the way they understood the world back all the way back to the 1930s, 40s. But what's amazing and rather amusing in most of those descriptions is clearly people weren't wildly enthusiastic about politicians even in the 1930s and 40s. Mm. But what they liked was that there was more of an opportunity to have a proper interaction with them. So they could actually engage with them in hustings, they could see them making mistakes, they could make a judgment about them. They listened to unbelievably half an hour of radio conversation, where, as they said, it was great because the politician had just enough time to have enough rope to hang himself. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. uh, it, it, Jerry, I think that the, it is possible to imagine, especially with new technology, but, but uh, constructing the new technology a different form of dialogue. is the reason why it's so hard, because the world has moved on. Technology drives politics, certainly drives media now, and, and politics is driven by media. Media yes. set the frame. And, and, and so you can't, I mean, it, it'd be lovely the, the, not to have this but, you know, the cycle. is with me, because I think that the 2017 general election in the United Kingdom was the first that wasn't fought through the mainstream media. It was actually fought through social media mm -hmm. and internet engagement. Mm -hmm. And it was the internet what won it, or didn't win it for anyone. It worked uh, well for Trump, uh, didn't it? Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that it is possible to imagine using uh, uh, the, the, the incredible technologies we have available to us now to develop a very different style of exchange mm. between elected politicians and uh, citizens themselves. And although I think in most instances we need to have some broad sense of what an elected politician's values are, we don't need a detailed manifesto of a range of boring commitments from them. <laughs> Actually, we need them to say, this is roughly where I'd like mostly to push, but then when it comes to different issues, there could be a dialogue with them. Mm. And I, Lucas shaking his head, but I do not see how you can construct an effective executive no without having elected representatives no, there. You, well, you want me to well, Yeah, please, go, <laughs> go. Yeah. Look, uh, at the end of the day, so we can talk about various models and the rest of it, and I'm happy to talk specifically to that one. At the end of the day, what we're both agreeing on, I think what we're all agreeing on is in a certain respect, maybe not Nicole, I'm not sure, uh, uh, sorry, uh, is uh, the precedent in Ireland was the citizens 
the Constitutional Convention. So we're saying, well, let's just have a constitution. Let's have a convention, a citizens' convention here in Australia, and let's how we might do our government better. And let's just let's hear from the Jerry Stokers and the Luca Belgiornos of the world and whoever else wants to present to that, and let's put it to the people. How do you? How do we want to do it better? So I would say, okay, um, elections are the poison of the modern times. Uh, elections are pitting candidates against each other uh, in a way that each of them cannot resolve from their positions because they weaken their brand in the process. So there is, we, we, we um, uh, compromise the capacity to actually collaborate from the get go. Mm. So I want to talk about improving the water in Canberra, water supply in Canberra. I've got a particular idea, right? Whatever it might be. It's quite a technical thing. But I've got to talk, you know, my policy position is this. Then what happens, somebody else, some other scientist comes up and says, well, actually, this might be a better thing. You know, the other candidate's saying something quite different. Mm, mm. So, you know, we've just completely thwarting the capacity to do stuff Productively. Mm. Mm. Now, Jerry's worried about the executive class. Well, fine, let's just get, you know, there's a whole lot of history that can talk about how you implement things. Is that me? <laughs> Is that my digestion? <laughs> The good news is we are going to provide dinner later on. <laughs> um, Luca, no, no, I think you make a very good point. I just want to come over to Nicole, though, because I want your response to a couple, just going back a little, back <laughs> a little bit, yes, a couple of things that have been raised um, from where you sit in your experience. Yeah, there's a lot of things to address already, but first of all, I think I still like elections. I like the carnivalesque, spectacular character of elections. <laughs> Maybe there's something wrong with how it's implemented at the moment, but it doesn't preclude us from thinking of more creative possibilities to make elections in the age of digital media be interesting, be spectacular, but also very informative. I think that doesn't preclude um, deliberative democracy from taking a more, or elections from taking a deliberative ethos. Mm -hmm. I think what we all agree with, though, is the importance of creative imagination when, it's th when we think about democratic processes. Because I think the last thing that we don't want from these democratic processes is for them to be routinized. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, they are gaining traction all over the world. Yes, it would be nice to institutionalize some of them. But once we start thinking of these processes as a toolkit mm. or something that, OK, there's this big issue, let's do a citizen jury, mm. and that kind of starts narrowing the way we imagine how democracy functions. And I think that's the beauty of the processes we've seen so far, because it's a product of imagination. It's a product of what's possible and what can happen. And I think all of us who are doing re stuff relation in relation to deliberation has to watch out as well, mm. that we shouldn't overly fetishize what already exists if it clips our imagination of what else we can think about. You asked about traction. Well, it's gaining traction all over the world. Recently, Mongolia implemented a rule about before any constitutional amendment can be implemented, there has to be a deliberative poll first. Of course, in principle, deliberative Democrats like myself should be very happy about it. But when I start reading criticisms about this process and it became routinized, the question now is, well, even if it's not the usual suspects who attend these processes, we know the outcome, we know the ending. So I think, yeah, the, the consensus in a way is not necessarily to just let these processes gain traction, but to insist on the creativity in conceptualizing, reconceptualizing, reflecting on what works, what doesn't, which processes are, are, are applicable to a particular issue when deliberation doesn't work for particular issues. Mm. I think it's time to actually throw open to the audience because I'm sure you will all have some questions, being a Canberra audience. Uh, there is a microphone. Um, Iman and um, Juliana have microphones. So if you've got a question, please shoot your hand up. I think, uh, and don't be shy, um, even though we do have a formidable panel here. Oh, we've got one, one here. I'd just like to hear the, um, the panel's thoughts on the, the Swiss version of democracy, where it is based on referendums, and, and whilst I under, I've picked up some reasons why you wouldn't use um, just referendums, but it, it, to me it makes sense in Australia, we're such a large geographic country, 
that that using referendums and and yesterday's referendum or a so-called referendum uh, was a good example of people having their say. Why why has it not come up in this doing democracy uh, differently? I'm surprised that it hasn't come up as as a way of doing it differently. Sorry, the survey you mean? Yeah, well, yeah, they actually use referendums. Oh. And, and it is citizen-initiated referendums. And they do it at all levels, not just at the, at the federal, uh, at what we would call mm. federal level. They even do it at a council level as well. But, but at the federal level, why? I'm surprised it hasn't come up as a possibility. Can I throw that to you, John? Yeah. Um, OK, uh, referenda. Um, so um, I used to live in the state of Oregon in the US um, for eight years, where we did have uh, citizen-initiated referenda. Um, so every two years, every, November every two years, um, there would be around uh, 20 to 30 questions on the ballot, um, which all the citizens of the state would, would, vote, would vote on. Um, so what happened? Well, um, if you were a well-financed uh, special interest, you could pay people to gather signatures to get the initiative on the ballot. Um, you could then conduct a campaign, a well-funded campaign, to try and convince people to uh, uh, to pass your uh, to pass the, the the measure that you you proposed. Um, so um, and then uh, what happens over time is that uh, uh, the measures that get passed all have the force of law. Um, progressively, they restrict the freedom of manoeuvre of, um, of of the state government. So you see this in California in particular, where the amount of the budget that the state government controls um, it shrinks over time as a result of accumulated um, referendum measures. Um, so. Uh, it's, it, I think ref referendums are really problematic. Um, I'm glad I don't live in a place that has citizen-initiated referenda anymore. Um, I think that um, uh, they, um, some of the ones that were passed, um, um, for example, a tax limitation measure, which um, was sold by its proponents as reducing taxes for ordinary homeowners. Um, in practice, you've read the fine print, which nobody did. It was a, it was a tax reduction for business. Um, almost all the benefits went to businesses. It meant the state education system was suddenly in an enormous financial crisis. It just had all kinds of terrible consequences. Um, so I'm not a fan of citizen-initiated referenda. The one saving grace that Oregon has done um, recently, um, in recognition of, of how bad citizen-initiated referenda can be, is to institute something called the Citizens' Initiative Review Process, which is essentially um, a citizen's jury um, or citizens panel, they, they call it, um, composed of about uh, 20, 25 people, uh, which deliberates a referendum question, um, and then it produces a one-page um, summary of their deliberations on what they think are the best arguments, both for and against the measure in question, and then that gets sent to every voter in the state. Um, they've only done that on a, on a, few, um, on a few measures, on a few questions, um, uh, medical use of marijuana, uh, mandatory sentences for prisoners, um, uh, something on business taxation. Um, but, but anyway, that's an attempt to introduce the deliberative component into the, re the referendum process, um, which is terrific. Um, the problem is getting citizens to uh, pay attention to that document um, in, because they get bombarded with so much other stuff um, from the, 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 the special interests involved. Uh, Luca? Just quickly, and I think the culture in in um, Switzerland is a little uh, more attuned to those sorts of things, so I think that they, um, uh, unlike, the, if you like, the Oregon's, the Oregoners, whatever you call them, um, uh, Oregonians. Oregonians. <laughs> is, that, is that like a spice, is it? Yes. yes. Um, so that, that, that they, uh, in Switzerland, they're more attuned to it, so they actually apply their minds to it. But, you know, here we were just talking earlier with, with uh, Jerry about, you know, Brexit, I mean, classic referenda, right? You know, and that's what happens, you know, the argument, apart from the fact that it was a sort of, it was this binary argument about, you know, in or out, you know, it got captured by all this campaign. It's what obviously we're concerned about in terms of the marriage equality survey as well. I, I was just going to say that um, you are looking at a, a victim of uh, a referendum. Uh, uh, I, I know in uh, Australia you're concerned about citizenship. I, I had 28 citizenships. I, I've now been reduced to one. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the well, the European Union. So uh, <laughs> uh, um, so I think that. Um, uh, but but. I'm actually more sympathetic to the idea of using this tool. And in fact, 
it is often, uh, as uh, John was hinting at, actually used in combination. And in fact, the Irish Constitutional Convention was then followed by a referendum that endorsed some of the key uh, proposals. So I, I think if it's linked to uh, perhaps deliberative processes or focused on issues which are not driven by the interests of big uh, big inter the interests of uh, big business or the interests of particular lobbies, but instead is trying to resolve quite a tricky moral or, or value issue within society of which the uh, recent uh, survey in Australia, I think, did quite effectively, then I wouldn't want to not have it in my range of options to offer people. Can I just, I, I know we've got some audience questions and microphone down here, I know Megan's got a question just here, but before we get to that, uh, ask all of you, the example we've just had, the same-sex marriage survey, is it a good, or has it been a good example of democracy being done differently, or is that rubbish? Well, I'm, I, I think it, it, it was, it was a, uh, an accidental good uh, uh, <laughs> practice because we all know why it was done, which is because mm. the politicians were all cowards, yeah. uh, and then uh, well, precisely, and it caused a lot of you yes, know, a lot of upset along the coward, way. Cowardly acts can sometimes as... lead to noble acts, and uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, the, that the, the the fact that it was an eighty percent turnout, the fact that it led to clearly a lot of conversations that people had. We've been doing some focus groups up in Queensland and it is absolutely fascinating listening to people talking about how they made up their minds in relation to this issue. So in that sense, I, I think that was a positive experience. Does anyone else have a, a strong view on that, Nicole? Yeah, I think what, what the, the result yesterday also shows is a lot of the vitriol we see online and on television, is a lot of it is manufactured is not quite the right word, but kind of overstated how hardened positions how hardened people's positions are. And I think the same can be said about um, Trump's America. We can always assume that Trump supporters are you know, ill-informed, uneducated kind of people, but when you actually get to their stories, you really see some reasoning there we may not necessarily agree with. So I think that's one of the messages, at least for me as someone who's not Australian, that, okay, maybe the vitriol is kind of manufactured, but if we go to the heart of issues and talk to people face to face, then maybe it's not that vitriolic. Interesting. Uh, well, well I, I think it, obviously, um, I think most people r recognise that, that there was a frustration that the political represent, the political class, were not reflective of the community. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we, mm. we were. We, yes, there may have been a uh, a debate around the, the the question, but if there was, uh, you, you know, as we found out, the majority of the population, okay, you could probably argue. Maybe it wasn't because it was only 80% turnout, but still, not a bad. Only an 80% turnout. Did you well, say? well, it's you know, effectively, it's 48% of the population that are that said yes. Biggest turnout we've had. Yeah, sure, sure, but it's you know, but, you know if you want, you know, what happened to the other 20%? What are they thinking? You know, yeah, exactly. they don't know how to post so hard. Even the Scandinavians would be quite yeah, no, pleased no, no, with no, an 80% no, 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 turnout. No, no, no. <laughs> well, all, all I'm saying is that we were frustrated by the political class, our representatives, unable to resolve this themselves. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, Megan, we've got a question here. Yep. Hi. Um, I just wanted to come at this from a perspective of a younger person. Um, a lot We're of all the... very young, thank you very much. <laughs> Some more than others. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the issues that I think are really right for citizens' juries are the things that are kind of future shaping, you know, the things we're not talking two or three years, but maybe 10, 20 years, how do we want our society to look like? Um, I think it's a bit of an experiment in kind of user testing, I suppose, to take a technological term of, of getting the end user to determine their own futures. So why are not all citizens' juries made up of exclusively 15 to 24-year-olds, is my question. Oh, my goodness me. Good, good, Would that work? Um, 15 to 24-year-olds? Um, Do you want to talk about case? Sorry. Yeah. It's a good point. Case work. I think if you're, to talking about this, if you're talking about the future, absolutely. Uh, I think it should be, I, I agree with you, it should be biased. In fact, I think in the surveys that you did, Mark, you know, there was one of the, one of the comments how to strengthen democracy was uh, uh, at least 30% of the, of the uh, representation in parliament should be under 35. Under 30. Yeah. Under 35. Under I think 35. it was, yeah. 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 Is, that, is that, John, is that a reasonable thing, though, to, to focus on, um, in, in these deliberative processes, focus on youth because that is the future? Yeah, um, we have um, um, 
PhD student, um, Kei Nishiyama, who's working on children's deliberations, and, and it's the theme, his theme is really, it's, it's never too young uh, to, to start um, de de deliberation, and, we, and uh, so there's, there's no problem there. Um, we also have evidence that, um, uh, that uh, lay citizen deliberations um, actually are much better at taking into account uh, the long-term considerations of, of policy than our, uh, than, than our standard um, electoral Mm. Politics, um, so we have we have evidence of that from um, from, um, from 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 many publics. Um, but the actually, I think when it, when it comes to um, uh, electoral politics, I think there is there is one um, reform which I'd like to see. If, if you if you do have referenda, um, and something like Brexit, for example, it was clear that it was the an older generation was uh, voting to protect their their own interests and at the same time um, destroy the prospects of a younger generation. So. Um, who are going to have to live with the consequences of those decisions. So why not um, wait voting by life expectancy? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about that. We've got a question yeah, over yeah. here. Just um, whilst we're getting the microphone at the back there, the idea like of, uh, yeah. of children and deliberative processes with children effects. is interesting. Yeah. Is this something that perhaps could be deliberative processes be taught in schools, mm -hmm. in primary oh, yeah, schools? Certainly. Well, that, is that, it happening? That was one of the recommendations of the yeah. Yeah. survey. Civics education in, in uh, well, do, civics is. Kind of do you think this is an idea that will gain traction, though, or is it gaining traction? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's this question about we've we've got we've got this obsession with the notion that we have to debate things to actually have this, you know, mm. to f mm. figure out what's the best thing for uh, public policy. Mm. It's n nothing wrong with a robust debate, mm. but let's not confuse it with power. Mm. This is the problem. We have conflated power mm. with public policy making. Yes, and it's so obvious, yet we can't disconnect from that because that's our mindset. Yeah, very true. Uh, uh, the question just up here, I think. Uh, whoever's okay. got the microphone? Yeah, I think Thank someone you. over there is first before oh, me. Oh, beg your pardon? Over here. Sorry. Sorry. Hi. Um, I suppose um, my, my question is really about passion. Um, and if anything, the recent postal survey it was postal, so it was really kind of old-fashioned. It was voluntary, no one made you do it, and yet so many people chose to do so. They felt engaged in the topic. Um, so there's lots of debate about technology and what that can do, but actually a bit of paper and a bit of passion, and even if it's voluntary, people will get involved. So in, in, in terms of deliberative democracy, where does passion fit into this? So if you have someone who wants to drive a particular cause, and wants to intervene and, and, and make change happen. Um, where do they fit into that? There was, there was a talk about you know, classic sort of democracy. Um, isn't that kind of next layer from democracy sort of anarchy and that in, in itself can also drive a kind of change? Where, where does that fit, fit in the mix? Is this too organized for, for real change? I, I, you know. Great question, thank you. Passion, anarchy, where does all of that fit in? We make a distinction between the community and community groups. No problem with community groups. Let those stakeholders, those advocacy groups, say their piece as passionately as they want to. But when it comes to the community, we want a representative, fair representation, random recruitment. Let, and okay, we're not saying that group shouldn't be passionate about what they're thinking about either. But we're not having the stake. We're not having the advocacy groups in the middle of it which is what we got today. But what if, what if a, a very passionate advocate uh, was chosen in that random selection? And as we know through, well certainly through communications, that uh, uh, a persuasive communicator can influence uh, a, a group very readily if they're, if they're strategic and smart about what they do. Surely that is a danger. Uh, I might respond to that because, uh, yeah, practically we do get, we do get very, I mean, Luca and I can talk for hours about the nuclear jury in South Australia where we had passionate activists in the room. Um, one of the things that I think works in the process is um, we, we build dialogue. We get people to, we te teach them about critical thinking such that they critically uh, think about their own views on things but also interrogate and test the views of others. So the whole process is designed in various different ways to have people explore and test and open it out before you come to judgment. The whole purpose and, and, and approach is very much about wide and then converge. 
So in, in so doing, people can come in passionate and then suddenly go, we've had people go, you know, I thought that, but just like you said in your own the citizens' parliament process, I came in dead certain this was the answer I was coming in to sell to the rest of the people in the room, but through time, which we've mentioned a few times, I mean, these people aren't experts, but they spend 40 to 50 hours on something. A counsellor on a, on a decision-making process possibly spends maybe 30 minutes. Mm. So they're actually really well equipped at the end of it to start making decisions, and they do it at a much, they move away from their individual and lift up to this position of what affects the whole. I now, I've now met somebody who thinks completely differently to me and I've started to consider that in the picture going forward. Mm. Okay. It, 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 is in, it is humbling to watch and inspiring, but given the time and resources to do that, people do it. Mm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take this question, but before I do, I'll just put the uh, panel on notice, but be, as, as we wind up, I'm going to ask each of you to to give us your one big idea or little idea that, it, <laughs> that is a, a practical thing that can actually happen, can be done to do democracy differently, something that we could actually make happen. But we'll come to that um, as we wrap up. Your question, sir. Yes, um, you spoke about deliberative democracy and citizens' juries and how sometimes politicians don't follow through on that. It made me think about the constitutional recognition of Aboriginals and also the treaty. And I'd be very interested in the panel's um, thoughts about that process generally. Thank you. This very long, long process of discussion, deliberation, etc., that um, has come to very little, unfortunately. Is that an example of trying to, to do democracy differently that has failed? Or is it an example of um, engagement that has been allowed to go on for too long? Can I, I just say, if I can say, um, here was the government's response to that, which was, sorry, this is a third house, whatever. Um, uh, Australians would not agree to that. Well, they said the same about marriage equality. Mm. So well, how do they think that that... This is the point, you know? They're showing themselves to be un unreflective, necessarily, mm. potentially unreflective of, of the community at large. OK. Do we have another burning question? Because otherwise we'll... No, we don't. I'm going to have to wrap up because we've gone way over time, but that's quite appropriate. So just for... Can each of you give me or share with us your, your one idea, big or small, of something very practical that we can make happen that that will help us do democracy differently that need not be big can be quite small something that you can all take responsibility to make happen no no I'm only joking, <laughs> I'm only joking about that but but something that, that is real that we can do differently so Jerry I'm going to start up with you yeah well I'm going to uh, argue for chipping away at uh, the elected politicians and beginning the process of changing their behaviour, which I agree is a bit of an uphill struggle, but I still think one that we should have a go at. And so my recommendation would be that we should have a serious reform of both party and campaign finance uh, so that we can make sure that uh, 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 parties are not beholden to inappropriate in interests or don't go... Uh, or just to follow the money. Uh, I think it's a, it's a reform that's possible to do. You can see pr practices around the world that would enable you to get there. That would be my first stepping stone to make sure that we don't just ask citizens to do more, we give the elected politicians a kick up the backside as well. OK. <laughs> Lovely. OK, great idea. I don't know how practical it is, but a great idea. Um, Nicole. Oh, I'm going to focus on practical, I think. Um, I, I just see the power of randomness and I think random sampling more and more through decision making, getting everyday people involved in this in just about anything you do is so powerful. And I would respond to the um, influence. I think that uh, there is no point entering into anything like deliberative democracy unless you've got absolute endorsement that there's a high level of influence. And that's why it's taken time for it to get traction, because people were scared. And now a few people have done it. I think we'll get 
more courage. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Luca. Thank you. Um, so I still see the Irish precedent as being a bit of the gold standard here. And I think to Jerry's point, we can have the politicians involved as they were there. Uh, we, have the, we have this golden opportunity now with so many questions that need to be resolved by constitutional reform, <clears throat> the dual citizenship thing, the indigenous recognition, <clears throat> dare I say the republic. <laughs> Let's put these questions to a citizen's convention. Do you, just, I, I won't I interrogate too much, but do you really think that could work with a republic after what we've been through with a republic referendum well, well, the republic? Part of the, part of the question, you know, the issue that we're talking about, which Nicole highlighted, is how, you know, here we are, a little group of conoscenti in our little tent here that kind of know a little bit about a little bit of democracy. You know, out there in TV land, like zero, it ain't there. So how do you build awareness of this subject, of, of this capacity. Well, it's slowly, you know, fringes. You know, so, so if we can uh, build this awareness and having politicians in the, in the tent, like Jerry says, is so important, mm. and that the Irish did it. Mm. OK. John. OK. Um, I'm, there's lots of things I could suggest. Um, most, but like, part of it also depends what you mean by, by, by sort of feasible and, and realistic. Um, most, of this, most of the discussion uh, this evening, uh, uh, perhaps quite rightly, is focused on Australia and then with an occasional look at um, other countries, uh, Switzerland, um, US, Ireland, um, UK. Um, we haven't talked about uh, global governance at all. Um, so, as a as a, an immodest suggestion for global governance, mm -hmm. um, how about a deliberative global citizens' assembly uh, constituted as a second chamber of the United Nations? Yeah. Now, um, you might think, oh, that's not realistic. This is a very However, small point, yes, right. Go on. Uh, there, small there idea. Is, there is a global campaign for a United Nations parliamentary assembly. Um, so Bob Brown, for example, is an enthusiast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of those people um, talk about uh, a directly elected um, Global Assembly. I would, I would say that a randomly, or more or less randomly selected um, citizens' assembly um, is is much much more feasible um, than a than an elected, a globally elected body. Great idea. How do we do it? How do we make it happen? Um, well, you have to convince people. That, uh, <laughs> uh, but in in. In, one of the interesting things. Okay, one, one of the interesting things about um, about the global system. I mean, we often think of it as sort of intractable, and uh, we we look at, say, the United Nations and think, well, global governance, and look at its um, institutions, the very slow way that it that grinds forward sometimes um, on issues like climate change, and think, well, why can't uh, why can't the global system be more like um, a state? Um, I think what we need to do instead is think of the opportunities of that system allows for institutional innovation because uh, it's, it's not subject to the constraints and the, the history uh, that, uh, that, 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 that states have. So introducing a body like this um, into, into global governance, into the UN, uh, may be sort of less jarring, it may be more feasible than introducing it at the, um, at the, national, at the national level. Um, why would people want to do it? Well, uh, frustration with the existing pr processes of global governance um, is, I think, so, is, is mm. I think fairly widespread. So there's at least mm. a, a, a little, mm. a, a little bit of opportunity there mm. for, for thinking about how to do it differently. Well, there's a big job for us. I'm sure we can make that happen in the next few years. Okay, Nicole. I think one of the biggest attractions of democracy as a form of government is that it has a capacity to correct its mistakes. So I think we should just keep on experimenting with these innovations, learn what works, learn what doesn't work, and in the process, be humble enough to recognize that you know, these processes are not foolproof, but we keep on learning because that's the essence, I think, of all of these processes. It's allow it allows us to reflect, it allows us to be reflexive citizens, and there's nothing wrong, I think, with celebrating um, modest achievements when we talk about um, these innovations. Would you be interested in becoming our next Prime Minister? I'm not Australian. <laughs> oh, God. <yeah. laughs>
Dear, oh dear, we need to fix that up, don't we? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank our panel? Jerry, Nicole, Luca, John and Nicole.